The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. I'm Vicki Healy with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Um, we are fortunate to have a terrific panel of speakers today who will be covering information on IEC's discount packages to access sustainable energy standards for rural electrification. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, just one important note before uh, we actually begin our presentations is this little disclaimer that I will read to you now. Um, the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. And the information provided in this webinar today will be featured on the Solutions Center resource library as one of many best practices resources that are reviewed and selected by our uh, technical experts. Uh, next slide. So before we begin, uh, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. And the first one is uh, audio options. So for audio, you do have two options. And you can either listen through your computer or over your telephone. Um, if you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. And uh, by doing this, this will eliminate the possibility of any feedback or echo that could occur. And um, if you select the telephone option, a box on the right-hand side, also the same box, will um, excuse me, uh, will display the telephone number and the audio pin that you should use uh, when you dial in. And just as a gentle reminder to our panelists, we ask that you uh, please mute your audio device before the presentations begin. Um, because your mics are active and, uh, again, this will eliminate the possibility of background noise. Also, this is one very important note. If you have any technical difficulties with this webinar, uh, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at the number that's listed on this slide, which is 888-259-3826, and um, the help desk will be happy to assist you with uh, troubleshooting any of the technical difficulties you might be having. Next slide, please. Um, uh, again, uh, to go over a couple more items regarding questions, if you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you will um, have the capability to type in your question. And if you're having difficulty viewing any of the materials through this webinar portal, um, you can find PDF copies of the presentation um, at the uh, URL links that are listed on this slide. Um, and you can open those PDF presentations and follow along as the speakers present. Also, just to let you know, we are not in addition to posting uh, the uh, PDF copies of the presentations on our website, uh, within a few weeks there will be an audio and video recording of the presentations. So you can go back and listen and view the presentations um, at any time, and also feel free feel free to share that information with uh, your colleagues. Next slide, please. Um, uh, real quickly, we have a really exciting agenda prepared for you today um, that is focused on IEC's discount packages to access sustainable energy standards for rural electrification. And as you can see from this slide, we have a very impressive group of panelists that will, that will be presenting on this topic. Um, before our speakers begin, I will um, begin their presentations. I will provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And following the presentations, we will have a question and answer session, um, a short survey to get feedback from you, and then we'll wrap up with discussion and closing remarks. Next slide, please. Uh, just a real quick uh, background on how the Solutions Center came to be. Uh, the Clean Energy Solutions Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial, and it is supported through a partnership with UN Energy, and um, uh, it was launched in April of 2011. It's primarily led by Australia and the United States government, as well as other SIM country partners. Um, and outcomes of this unique partnership include support of developing countries through enhancement of resources and policies relating to energy access, and we provide no-cost policy assistance and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, um, such as the webinar that you're attending today. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the Solutions Center has four primary goals. It serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. We share policy best practices, data, analysis tools um, that are specific to clean energy policies and programs. And the Solutions Center delivers dynamic services that enables uh, expert assistance, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and sharing of experiences. And lastly, the center uh, fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation um, occurring around the globe. Next slide, please. Uh, one, uh, real quickly, a uh, marquee feature that the Solutions Center provides is expert policy assistance. And you'll see on this slide pictures of some of, we have more than 30 policy experts on our team, and this slide just shows a few of the pictures of some of our experts. Um, this is a very valuable service. It's offered through the Solutions Center. Um, again, we've established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe. And they are available to provide remote policy advice and assistance and analysis to all countries. And the key feature of this is this policy advice and assistance is provided at no cost. Um, and of course, we cover all the ranges of uh, clean energy topics, including energy access, efficiency, renewables, smart grids, microgrids, transportation, utilities, and regulations. And we encourage you to, um, if you have a, a need for policy advice or assistance, to contact us. We'll be um, happy to match you up with an expert to help answer your questions. Next slide, please. Um, a, a couple of ways to just how you can become involved. Again, going back to the uh, policy advice assistance, uh, you can request that. Um, and we can also tailor uh, resources and such as that for your country or region. Uh, again, participating in webinars like you're doing right now. Um, we welcome your advice and recommendations on resources that we can share through our curated library of um, reports and data and analysis and tools. And we have a newsletter that we welcome you to sign up for. Next slide, please. Um, so today, uh, I will just quickly, briefly introduce our panelists. Um, first, we'll have Rishinda Van Leeuwen, who's the Executive Director um, and Energy of uh, Director of the Energy Access Initiative at UN Foundation. Next slide. We'll have uh, Francisco Bochel, who is an analyst at the International Renewable Energy Agency, also known as IRENA. Next slide, please. We have Francois Rauser, who's Executive Secretary and ILO at IEC Affiliate Country Program at the International Electrotechnical Commission. Next slide, please. Um, we also oh, we're honored to have uh, Howard Barrigmo, who's Emeritus Secretary at IEC's Technical Committee 82 um, on Solar Photovoltaic Energy Systems. Next slide, we have Arnie Jacobson, Director of SHAP Energy Research Center. And last but certainly not least, we have Guylaine Fournay, who is uh, Head of Sales and Business Development at the Electrotechnical Commission. Um, and with that, I would like to turn over the webinar to Rashinda if she is on the line. for some opening remarks. Um, hi, Vicki and everybody on the webinar. This is uh, Rachenda Van Loo, and I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Rachenda. Okay, perfect. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Rachenda Van Loo, and as, as Vicki had said, and um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this morning's webinar. Um, Thanks very much again to the Clean Energy Solutions Center for hosting us and to all the panelists that you're going to be hearing from um, during the course of this morning. Um, I just want to give a couple of, uh, of brief overview remarks um, to set some of the context for our work with the International Electrotechnical Commission. Uh, first slide, please. Um, I believe you should be looking at, and I apologize, I'm calling in. I don't have access to the slides. So if we get out of sync, then please just let me know. But I, I only have a, an audio option, but I just want to give a very uh, 
a short background to the work of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. Hopefully by now um, most if not all of the participants within the webinar are familiar with the initiative which was launched by the United Nations Secretary General in 2011 specifically to focus on how the world can be looking at um, uh, making the changes that are needed uh, from a standpoint of sustainable development in three different areas. First of all, energy access and looking towards achieving global universal energy access with a, a, a goal of um, 2030 for us to be able to achieve energy access, which includes um, such things as uh, universal access to at least basic electrification and also looking at um, universal access to uh, cleaner and, and more modern um, cooking fuels and uh, appliances. Um, and then the two other objectives also are very much focusing on uh, uh, increasing our energy efficiency as a world and then also doubling the amount of renewable energy that we are using um, globally within uh, our energy systems. Um, and the, uh, the, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative um, has been developing, um, in fact, so much so that the Director General of the UN Industrial Development Organization is leaving his post as Director General as of July 1st to become uh, the Chief Executive Officer of this initiative, which is now not only led by the United Nations Secretary General, but also um, in concert with the President of the World Bank um, and the World Bank as an equal partner. Um, so it's been building momentum. Um, you will be, you will have heard about the 2012 International Year of Sustainable Energy for All last year, which was tremendously successful with engagement by many, many countries around the world, both developing countries and OECD countries. And next year we are going to be um, launching the Decade of Sustainable Energy, uh, which will run from 2014 to 2024. Um, in this context, uh, next slide please, um, I hope that's the overview of the practitioner network. Um, the United Nations Foundation established uh, an energy access practitioner network in 2011 as part of our contribution towards the work of sustainable energy for all. Um, the network was really intended to focus on supporting, catalyzing advocacy um, on the, both the policy side but also on developing partnerships, highlighting funding needs, highlighting challenges and solutions to those challenges faced in the sector by particularly market-led approaches towards achieving um, universal energy access, focusing very much on the contribution of microgrid and off-grid um, solutions in that mix. Um, certainly, we're looking very much at grid extension to be continuing as well, um, but the reason and, and the rationale behind our uh, establishing it this way was uh, recognizing, in fact, that there was not a unified global voice um, for the off-grid and the microgrid sector, and at the same time, um, there was a very strong emphasis on the contribution that can be made um, through both microgrids and off-grid solutions um, as part of the answer in the overall landscape of achieving energy access. So it's grown rapidly um, since we started it. Um, last year by Rio Plus 20 we had 300 members. Today, uh, just less than one year later, we now have 1,200 members drawn from 191 countries. Um, so it's been tremendously um, uh, successful in terms of mobilizing the community and we are very much looking uh, for continued growth but also advocacy around some of the changes that are needed um, in order to help mobilize the work that you are all undertaking. And today's uh, webinar in part is, um, is, is uh, a representation of some of the work that has been quietly ongoing behind the scenes through a range of partnerships. In particular, I want to thank the International Electrotechnical Commission, um, and they will tell you a little bit about what they have been doing um, in support of sustainable energy for all, but specifically understanding uh, the needs of practitioners, um, and particularly within that, some of the smaller companies, um, the, the SMEs that are delivering these solutions and some of the constraints that they've been facing. 
Um, lastly, I just want to talk about the work of the practitioner network as it relates to standards. Um, we've had a very active standards working group as one of the working groups that we host within the practitioner network, very ably led by Munir Azam, the CEO from Solar One, and Jack Warner. Um, uh, and and uh, and I'm blanking on Jack's institution. I'm about my apologies. Um, but uh, they have been really focusing on helping us understand the broader context, not only in terms of the technical aspects of solutions and really looking at the need for driving quality in the sector and um, that is an area particularly that ultimately supports consumer uh, protection um, and when we're working particularly on the energy access issues with very low income communities um, my maxim personally is you know if you if you can only pay once for it then we'd better be delivering a good product or service to that consumer to that customer um, because they can't afford to purchase it twice. Um, the second area that we've been focusing on, on standards is really looking at the ecosystem of services as well, particularly relating to the training that's required in order for us to be able to truly um, have a system of sustainable energy in a country in a given context. So we've been looking very much um, at ensuring that not only do we have the solutions and the quality of solutions in place, but that we also can be catalyzing um, the development and the training of the technicians or the electricians and the other, um, the human resource side of it as well to ensure that we can drive a sustainable ecosystem of change. So thank you to everybody. Um, I'm sorry I can't stay on for the full webinar. My colleague Yasmin Erboy will um, provide context and closing remarks from the United Nations Foundation. Um, but. Uh, Back over to you, Vicky, and uh, uh, we again we thank all of our panelists for joining us this morning. Thank you, Rashenda, uh, for those um, very nice opening remarks, and um, very appreciated. Uh, with that, I think we are turning over now to Francisco, who will be presenting first. Um, so, Francisco, with that, welcome, and um, feel free to move forward. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or evening to everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers of this important webinar for inviting Irina to, to present our work in the field of standardization for renewable energy technologies. Uh, we are convinced at Irina of the importance of standards and quality assurance for a sustainable and accelerated deployment of renewables at a global scale. So today I'm pleased to briefly present to you our work in this field. Unfortunately, I cannot see the slides on my screen. I don't know. I have a technical problem, I think. Vicky, can you see my slides on the screen? Uh, yes, I can see your slide. Oh, um, OK. Yeah. Well, and then, then it's OK. We can proceed, and I will assume that <laughs> uh, the okay. participants are, are yeah, uh, it, looking it, at, at the slides. Okay, yeah, just let us know when, when you're ready for the next slide, and yeah. if uh, something doesn't move forward, I'll let you know. Okay, thanks. Then uh, next slide, please. So just a few words about our organization. The International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, is an intergovernmental agency. We have the mandate to support the sustainable deployment of, of all types of renewable energy. Our work program is defined then by our member countries during their annual assembly. Our agency was founded in 2009 and its first assembly was held in 2011. The headquarters are in Abu Dhabi, but we also have our innovation and technology center located in Bonn, Germany. At present, 159 countries plus the European Union are affiliated with 109 full members and 51 countries in the process of becoming full members of the agency. Next slide, please. We are convinced at IRENA that countries can use the standards in benefit of their renewable energy deployment programs. For example, national regulations as well as tendering documents concerning renewable energy can refer to standards when indicating in the documents the technical requirements to be complied with. 
The standards can also be a good documented source of information concerning the best available technologies and practices concerning specific applications. Certification against the standards is also a useful tool to mitigate technical project risks and then granting easier access to financial sources. We think that all these benefits may result in national renewable energy markets founded on appropriate requirements for quality and safety. Next slide, please. Due to the importance of standardization for the renewable energy sector, IRENA has carried out last year a needs and gaps analysis of international standardization for renewables. This work that was led by Mr. Gideon Richards, he is an experienced expert in the field and a member of the ISO Strategic Advisory Group in Energy Efficiency and Renewables, was also enriched by input from different organizations including ISO, IEC, UNIRO, ICT, SD and others. The identified gaps and options to address them were also discussed in an experts workshop organized last autumn in Bonn where we have representatives from standards bodies, industrial associations, manufacturers, banks, and other stakeholders. This story includes a set of recommendations to overcome the issues identified during the analysis, and those recommendations were categorized in four main groups. Recommendations to disseminate information and knowledge, to define a strategic framework for the standardization, to support the engagement of all stakeholders in the process, and to address specific needs in standards, for example, related to environmental and sustainability aspects. Next, I will provide to you some more details and some highlights on the identified gaps and the possible solutions. Next slide, please. I would like to start by saying that standards should not be seen as isolated documents, but as part of a broader quality assurance framework. This framework that on the slide is called quality infrastructure includes different elements in addition to standards such as calibration and metrology, testing and inspection, accreditation and certification. And strengthening the whole quality infrastructure and not only standards being a very important part as they are will permit that the related benefits have a bigger impact on the national renewable energy market. Next slide, please. As mentioned before, the standards and quality infrastructure in general can support national regulations. One example, as already seen in some countries, is the link, for instance, between financial incentive initiatives, such as feeding tariff, for example, and the use of tested and certified equipment. This can support the market for eligible technologies under the initiative as well as increase the likelihood that the initiative itself will deliver what was expected and needed by the customers. Next slide, please. Now, if we look, for example, at small-scale applications for renewable energy technologies, we observe that more and more domestic producers are emerging in developed and developing countries. For example, the World Wind Energy Association, in their last uh, report, identify more than 300 registered manufacturers for small wind turbines. So this might be just a small fraction of the total number of manufacturers available worldwide. The issue now is that not all manufacturers may have the experience or capacity to produce good quality products. And in some regions, equipment is failing due to quality issues. This results in the particular manufacturer, but in the whole technology segment therefore impacting the whole market for such technology in a very negative way. Then we have an excellent technology and more and more people interest to manufacture it. Now we need to support that they get access to the right tools to be capable to produce good quality products. The next slide please. However, it is also true that the cost related to testing and certifying their products might be too high for these producers of uh, small-scale technologies. The question then is how to balance the costs related to quality infrastructure and the related benefits concerning performance, safety, etc. In ARENA we have started an analysis of these issues 
and how quality infrastructure can be built or improved in an affordable manner, particularly for small-scale applications in developing countries. We will start by studying the case of solar water heaters and small wind turbines, and we will expand, expand this work in the future. Next slide, please. IRENA's story on standardization also identified more than 570 standards relevant to renewable energy, and this is not an exhaustive inventory. However, the last CAPE analysis showed that most of these standards are related to the product or equipment itself, for example, the hydro turbines or the PV cells, but few to the installation and post-installation aspects, including, for instance, operation and maintenance of the complete system. Next slide, please. Now, the other question is, what is the result of deploying systems with good quality products, but not properly installed, for example? So, no matter that you use the best available equipment, if it is not installed, operated, and maintained properly. These types of failures that we see on the slide, due to wrong wiring or wrong installation of inverters and TV systems, have been observed, for example, in some islands in the Pacific region, where IRENA is carrying out work in this area of standardization at present. This is why we consider that the development and use of sound standards concerning the competence and skills of installers, operators, and maintenance staff is crucial. In other words, do not think in terms of product standards, but system standards. The next slide, please. One more need identified in our analysis concerns the lack of awareness and knowledge on what international standards are available and how to use them. In this area, IRENA has started also the development of an information platform for the standards and will also include information concerning patterns relevant to renewable energy. We are partnering with organizations like ISO and IEC to get access to the appropriate information and make it make it uh, easily accessible to users. The aim is to optimize the access to information, promote the benefits of quality infrastructure and standards, and facilitate the cooperation between standards users and standards makers, as well as between countries. Next slide, please. Finally, a very important issue is also the involvement of all relevant stakeholders in the international standardization process including policy makers, industry, manufacturers, and users, but also from a geographical perspective, developed and developing countries should be actively involved to ensure that respective needs and issues are addressed in international standards. For this, it's very important in the case of developing countries that they make use of existing mechanisms to participate, such as the IC affiliate country program that will be presented in detail during this webinar by or IEC friends, and also the ISO Developing Countries Committee DEFCO. Also, other mechanisms can be explored for experts from underrepresented regions to participate in the process, as uh, virtual meetings or forums where users from these regions can discuss particular needs with members of the technical committees developing the standards. And last, but definitely not least, is to make the standards affordable to users in these regions via, for instance, discounted prices and additional funding support. In our study, in fact, we use the case of the IC62257 series for uh, rural electrification as an example of the cost of the standards and the impact that it may have in a rural community. Today, we are glad to see the initiative from IC and the UN Foundation to provide precisely this series of standards at a discount price. We certainly commend such type of initiatives, and we hope that more similar ones will follow in the near future. Next slide, please. Well, with this, I conclude my presentation. My contact details are on the screen. Please feel free to contact me if you are interested in any of the mentioned uh, or other activities in the arena. In this slide, you can also find the link to download our report for free. Um, well, I would like to thank you all for your kind attention. 
Thank you very much. Uh, should I introduce the next speaker, Vicky? Uh, that's fine, or I can go ahead and do that uh, for you, Francisco, but thank you for I, that I great. Okay, go feel free. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, so now it's also my pleasure to introduce a uh, good friend and colleague, uh, Mrs. Francois uh, Rousseau. She is the Executive Secretary of the IEC Affiliate Country Program at the International Electrochemical Commission. And now I know that she is working very strongly and devoted to really get uh, developing countries involved in the process. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce Francois. And um, yeah, dear Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francisco, and uh, hello to everybody. So I will be happy to give you a short presentation of the IEC and uh, our program for developing countries. And I'm really happy that IEC is on board today with all of you for this uh, webinar. Next slide, please. I won't go into detail, but just to remind you where we work. We work on the international level together with other organizations such as ISO or ITU. And we work on the national level, that's where our members are, and at the IEC they are called national committees. But of course we have interaction with the regional bodies which have signed some cooperation agreement with us. So in Africa, in America, especially Latin America, and Europe and the Europe uh, Asian countries. Next, please. Well, the IEC is a rather old lady because we are over uh, 100 years old. And uh, our mission is to promote the cooperation on the international level for all questions of standardization and conformity assessment. And of course, we prepare international standards and technical specifications. Next slide. You might have heard of the IC family. By family, we understand the grouping of our members, which are 82 countries, and the countries that are participating in our free program for developing countries, the affiliate country program. So together, the IC family counts 164 countries. Next slide, please. Within the IC membership, we differentiate between full members, there are 60 countries, and associate members, 22 countries. Associate membership is a form of membership for countries that have limited resources. They do have access to all our standards, but they have a limited uh, voting right. They can, all the same, vote in four technical committees of their choice such as, for example, TC82, if they chose to. We have in our catalog almost 7,000 publications that are prepared by technical committees or subcommittees. And we also administer three conformity assessment systems. Next slide, please. I won't go at all into detail for this uh, organization chart, but what is interesting is to note that the IC work on three uh, uh, sections, if you want, three sectors. The standardization, of course, but also conformity assessment and uh, the market strategy. The market strategy is the most recent of our uh, management board. And the, the aim is to advise the IEC on future fields for standardization. As you know, electrotechnology is a domain that changes rapidly, and we always need to be ahead on what comes in the future. Next slide, please. I mentioned that we work on the national level, and our member is called the National Committee. The National Committee brings together all stakeholders that are involved in the field of electrotechnology. And it is a very wide range which covers all electrical and electronic equipment. In the National Committee, we will have uh, experts coming from the industry, but also the SMEs, the government, the, the university, and so on. That's where we will find the experts that will work in the Technical Committee such as TC82 that is going to prepare to present their work uh, later on in this webinar. Next slide, please. Now, 
to develop standards is a good thing, but they have to be used. They, they shouldn't stay in a, in a cupboard or a drawer. So the best way to use standards, and especially international standards, is to use them to check that a product or a system is safe, performant, and reliable. And that's what we call conformity assessment. And this is possible within the IC against IC international standards. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, we, one of the pillars of the IC is conformity assessment. And the IC administers three systems. Each have a special uh, purpose. The most important of the three is called the ICEE, and it deals with electronic equipment and components. It is sometimes referred to the CB scheme, but in fact the CB scheme is only one of the schemes that is administered by the system. The second one, the ICEX, is more specific. It's to do with equipment for use in explosive atmospheres, such as petrol station, hospital, and so on. And the third one is to check the quality of electronic components. Next slide, please. Now we'll come to our affiliate country program. Uh, we have 82 countries, developing countries, in this program. But uh, as you can notice on this slide, some countries are marked in red. And there are countries that have been actually invited to join this program, and they've not yet responded. Uh, we are at the moment waiting for confirmation from St. Kitts and Nevis that should join the program in the next few weeks. Next slide, please. So the Affiliate Country Program was launched in 2001, and that was in the response from a call from the WTO to encourage the participation of developing countries in international standardization. This program is free of charge, and it is not, of course, a kind of membership. Therefore, our affiliates are not considered our members, and they have no voting rights. But they, have, uh, they enjoy a few benefits. One of them is to have access to 200 standards that they can choose in that catalog of almost 7,000 standards. They can choose for national use. We also help our affiliates to establish a national electrotechnical committee so that they benefit from the same structure as our members, which will allow them to use the program to its full extent. Because the second aspect of the program is to encourage developing countries to have an active part in the development of international standards, which is exactly what the WTO is uh, looking for. They can select 10 technical fields, technical committees, and they will be given some login to download the document and give their comment. Next slide, please. Our affiliates also receive guidance to use our conformity assessment system. They may come to the IC annual meeting, which is called the general meeting, where they can attend some technical meetings. Each year, we have a few technical meetings, sometimes many of them, that decide to meet during the general meeting. And I know this year, TC82 is going to meet in New Delhi in India. We're going to have a, a forum for affiliate and the a workshop that we organize for developing countries. And this year, the topic is going to be uh, photovoltaic standards for developing countries. And we'll have actually Arnie on board, and most probably Irena is going to participate actively too. We also have a website zone for affiliates, and we provide some assistance through virtual meetings. In 2009, we launched a new status for those countries that had reached the boundaries of the program. Next slide, please. This is the affiliate team, as we call it. So the affiliate program as a leader, uh, this year, since last year, it's Mr. Funcho Wangi from Bhutan. He succeeded to Carlos Rodriguez from Costa Rica, who was a previous leader and who is now coordinating the participation of our affiliate countries in Latin America. We have another coordinator for Africa, Eva Oduo from Kenya, who happens to be as well the vice president of AFSEC, AFSEC being the equivalent to the IC on the African continent. 
and of course the Secretary in Geneva. I have two collaborators working with me to serve the needs of our affiliate countries. Next slide, please. We, we have succeeded in helping our, our affiliate to establish uh, their national committees, and as you can see, almost 50% have now a national electrotechnical committee. There will be meeting during the forum, uh, during the general meeting. This is a chance to, to share their experience, good and bad, and also to help those who are not that far to learn to establish the national committee. We try to visit the national committees when we are uh, attending a regional event, and that will be the case this year for a couple of countries such as Bhutan, Cambodia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ecuador, and Peru. Ten of them have upgraded to IC members. Next slide, please. Although this is not the objective of the program to push the countries to join the IC, they can stay in the program as long as they need to. We, uh, we have, it's a sort of springboard for those who want more from the IC. And as you can see, 10 countries, you have the list, have now joined the IC as members. Next slide, please. OK, this is our last slide. Uh, our objective for this year and next year, it is, of course, to get more countries to become affiliate plus. Uh, to be an Affiliate Plus country, the country has to have adopted at least 50 uh, IC standards as national standards and to have established a national committee. And that will give them access to 400 standards free of charge for adoption instead of 200 and will give them priority in our mentoring program. This mentoring program is going to be activated in July this year, so very near now as well as we're going to launch a new status in conformity assessment for our affiliate countries. We are happy to be a partner now for the UN Sustainable Energy for All initiative, and we are going to work more and more with the regional bodies. This year we've had specific collaboration with the AFSEC, COPAN, TASC, and the EAST. We are hoping to reach out to the Pacific Islands and hoping very much that the partnership with the uh, Sustainable Energy for All will help us do that. There are a few small islands which are not yet benefiting from the program and they could, they could very easily do as it's free of charge. We also try to uh, encourage West African countries to be more active and we're doing that through virtual training and uh, I'm going also to visit the uh, DRC in August back to back with the AFSEC uh, general uh, meeting. Next slide and last one. So if you have any question, I'll be very, very happy to take your question. And now I would like to, uh, for the transition to uh, Howard Barikmo, who was the former secretary of TC82 and who is going to present this technical committee and, and its work. Howard, it's yours. Thank you, Francois. I must admit uh, I'm having technical problems, but I'll try to at least uh, alleviate that. I, I am listening also to the local national public radio station here in Phoenix, and there's no way I can get rid of it. So hopefully it's not being fed through to you all. At any rate, my name is Howard Burek. Well, I was most recently the secretary of TC82. And if we can go to the next slide, we can see what uh, it's all about. Oops. Am I getting through it all? Uh, there. OK. Uh, TC82 has been charged by the IAC to write all the standards relating to photovoltaics for them. And we do this in s six working groups. Working group one is glossary, two modules, three systems. Working group six, balance of systems, and then uh, working group seven and concentrators. But the big one that we're going to be talking about today is joint working group one that has as its charter uh, technical specifications for decentralized rural electrification projects. Next slide. And uh, joint working group one is led by, now I'll have to, I'll have to go through his name because I, usually call him Siva. Siva Ganthan Jayasingam of Malaysia, 
And the co-convener of that work, working group is Leon Andre Drutsky of South Africa. They have written over the years some 20 technical specifications in the 62257 recommendations for small renewable energy and hybrid systems for rural electrification series. And if you want the titles and previews of these, you can go to the IEC web store site and get those in abstracts of what in the world they do. Next slide, please. Now, Arnie Jacobson, who will do most of the talking on the, our most recent publication, 62257-9-5, uh, he was a project leader on it, and he'll lead you through the steps of why this document is necessary to introduce these types of quality products in the developing world. He will also mention that revision of other documents in the series is imminent in Joint Working Group 1, and ask for your input to the process if you are interested. So contact either Francois or me for further information if you want to help us out in, in these areas. And without further ado, let's go to Arne. And I think I've done a decent job of uh, introducing you, haven't I? If not, why, let us, let us know what you need to have filled in. Arne, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Howard. And uh, thanks to everyone for uh, joining, the, uh, joining the webinar and to the organizers. Um, I should note uh, that in addition uh, to being an active member of Technical Committee 82, uh, specifically in Joint Working Group 1, um, I also play a leading role in um, uh, quality assurance activities for the IFC and World Bank's Lighting Africa and Lighting Asia programs. And so part of what I'll be talking about is uh, a focus on IEC Technical Specification 62257-9-5, which Howard just mentioned but also how it uh, uh, is related to uh, and integrated into the um, quality assurance activities of the Lighting Africa and Lighting Asia programs. And in terms of quality assurance broadly, um, uh, on both the IEC side and the Lighting Africa and Lighting Asia side, um, uh, we um, have been working from a set of uh, key propositions. And I think one, uh, first and foremost, is that effective quality assurance efforts can help enable energy access for low-income people in off-grid areas. Uh, we see the 6257 series of the IEC as a series that has a, a great potential to play a leading role uh, in providing uh, standardized test methods and quality metrics for, uh, for this broader effort. Um, in the context of doing this work, uh, we're um, very aware of the need to strike an effective or an appropriate balance between quality and affordability uh, given the particular purchasing power and needs of, of uh, the people uh, and markets that we're working to serve. And so in order to do effective standards development, we need to have um, not only an understanding of the technology and the technology trends, but also uh, careful understanding of end user needs, um, uh, the purchasing power and, and ability to, to, uh, um, to access these technologies as well as uh, broader market dynamics. And so uh, we work very hard to try and pull all of those things together as we think about uh, the development of uh, standards documents and quality assurance programs in this arena. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, uh, in terms of these initial propositions, um, we believe pretty strongly that widespread adoption of a harmonized set of test methods standards brings benefits to a number of stakeholders. And so we are uh, strongly encouraging um, uh, governments and organizations uh, to adopt uh, um, uh, these IEC standards and to um, uh, take a harmonized approach to, uh, to uh, quality assurance efforts. Next slide, please. So focusing initially on uh, the, uh, uh, the IEC 62257-9-5 document, this is a document that uh, is intended to provide a quality of framework for off-grid lighting systems. And uh, this is a document that was published um, as a, uh, uh, the most recent uh, uh, revised edition, which is the second edition of this document, uh, was published um, uh, last month, uh, April of 2013, uh, after moving through um, the IEC's rigorous um,
Next slide, please. It's on the way. Sorry for the delay, Arnie. No problem. System delay. Okay. My apologies. It's not catching up with itself. Hang on one second. <laughs> Seems to have frozen. Sorry about this, Arnie. Sorry about the technical difficulties, everyone. Uh, no problem. I could um, okay. continue. If you could on. keep speaking, yes. Why don't you go yeah. ahead, and I'll hope that it catches up with itself. Thank you. Okay. Um, That's the, the one that's used uh, for um, activities such as uh, verification of products uh, in the context, uh, for example, of a certification program. Um, but there are also a, a several derivative um, test methodologies included in the document that are, are quite similar but are tailored to, uh, to other specific purposes, such as uh, conducting a market check test of a, of a product after um, um, it has already uh, um, gone through uh, testing and verification uh, or doing initial screening of a product uh, prior to, uh, to going through uh, the full test method. Um, so the, the uh, 6257 uh, excuse me, 6257-9-5 document includes uh, all of those test methods. It also includes a framework for um, uh, uh, specifying minimum quality standards, uh, performance targets, and warranty requirements. Um, and so what I mean by a framework is that it, it, it uh, provides guidelines and a set of metrics for, um, for specifying um, what uh, the pass criteria would be for, uh, for meeting those sorts of things. But the document doesn't it itself specify the, the, the pass criteria. The idea there is that um, uh, individual quality assurance programs would uh, would specify their own passing thresholds, but hopefully would be doing that using this common uh, common framework uh, that is matched up with the uh, with the test methodologies uh, into a single system. And then the third uh, uh, item that's included in the um, uh, in the document are it, it is a uh, standardized framework for reporting uh, verified performance for products in the form of a standardized uh, specification. Uh, sheet template, uh, and so the document includes all uh, all of those uh, elements. Um, next slide. Um, is there uh, still a delay in advancing? There is. I'm sorry, Arnie. There is a significant delay. The system seems to be having some delay. So if you can keep speaking to your slides, I'll just keep trying to catch up. Okay. Oh, there we are. Um, cool. So um, much of the material that's included in the 6257-9-5 uh, document was originally developed under the IFC and World Bank's Lighting Africa program. And so those of you who are familiar with the um, uh, Lighting Africa quality test method will be uh, will be familiar with much of the material. The um, Lighting Asia program was launched in 2012, and they also uh, so that program has also uh, contributed uh, to uh, to the effort. Um, and integration of uh, all of that material into uh, um, 
IEC technical specification 6257-9-5 was supported financially by uh, U.S. Department of Energy uh, in partnership with IFC World Bank and of course uh, of course the IEC so this was uh, um, very much a team effort. Next slide please. Um, and I'll just start uh, start talking. The um, uh, Lighting Global Quality Assurance Program um, is the name of the program that now supports both the Lighting Africa and the Lighting Asia uh, um, quality assurance activities. And um, the IEC document is a foundational document for the Lighting Global Quality Assurance uh, um, effort. Um, and so I think this really points to the importance of not just thinking of these documents in isolation, but uh, um, linking them uh, um, to uh, an active uh, quality assurance effort that um, uh, that can utilize them in in the context of a of a program. Actually, um, if we could go back one slide, that would be that would be great. Okay, no, actually go forward. I think that they're not quite in the same order that I had thought that they were in. Um, so uh, the development of the Lighting Global Quality Assurance Framework has been um, a, a collaborative one with a number of st stakeholders, many of which are, are shown here. And as I mentioned, the Lighting Global Program uh, supports both the Lighting Africa and the uh, Lighting Asia uh, initiatives. Um, uh, in the context of developing the um, uh, technical specification 6257-9-5, a number of these organizations, uh, as well as others not shown here, provided key input in a, in a stakeholder process. And uh, um, a number of private sector companies um, uh, participated in that uh, as well. Over 15 companies provided uh, comments. And um, as we move forward, both in revising the 6257 dash 9 dash 5 document and also working on other documents within the IEC series. Uh, we encourage uh, similar levels uh, and actually even greater levels of participation from, uh, from key stakeholders. Next slide. And uh, the next slide, when it comes up, will um, uh, show a framework that indicates where the 6257-9-5 uh, document fits into the, uh, the broader Lighting Global Program. Uh, you can see that the Lighting Global Program has three key areas of, uh, of activity, uh, and they include um, specifying and using uh, test methods and standards. Um, uh, there is a, a testing and verification uh, uh, activity where products are submitted for, for testing and their performance is uh, evaluated through laboratory testing. And, uh, and then there's, of course, a dimension that involves communicating uh, the quality of products that meet the, the, um, the minimum quality standards to the, uh, to the broader market. Um, and 6257-9-5 is a, a foundational uh, document in that in that framework, um, and um, uh, so of course it defines the test methods and quality met metrics that are used in the program, uh, and all of the uh, other activities uh, are um, uh, related to that or draw from from those um, original test methods and, and and that framework. Next slide. The um, uh, technical specification um, is being used in a, uh, is currently in the context of a very active and robust quality assurance program, the Lighting Global Quality Assurance Program. So to date, this um, these set of test methods um, uh, have been um, used uh, to evaluate more than 100 products on a, on a commercial basis with companies submitting those products. Uh, for testing and uh, paying a fee for 
for that testing. Um, uh, more than 40 companies have uh, submitted at least one product for testing, and a number of products have submitted or companies have submitted more than one product. Um, to date, 54 products have met the Lighting Global uh, Program's minimum quality standards, and um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 1.4 million uh, quality assured products or, or qual products that have been quality assured through this program uh, have been sold uh, on a commercial basis, and a similar number of products uh, have been sold in Asia, although we don't have uh, the numbers documented in quite the, quite the same way. Uh, so th this document is, is um, being used in a very, very active quality assurance program. Next slide. Um, but one of our uh, key goals going forward is to um, encourage widespread adoption of, uh, of this quality assurance framework. Uh, we um, feel pretty strongly that having a common uh, quality assurance framework uh, um, across multiple markets will have a number of, uh, of benefits uh, for companies who are operating in this space. Um, uh, this simplifies uh, quality assurance uh, testing and verification for them because they only need to engage with a, a single framework, uh, which ends up saving them time and money. Um, supply chain actors, uh, wholesale distributors, uh, bulk purchase, uh, uh, bulk purchasing organizations, um, uh, financial organizations that have an interest in this space, um, etc., um, would only need to understand a single quality assurance framework if we were able to, to achieve uh, widespread adoption. And then, of course, uh, um, the buyers of these products end up benefiting uh, from a simplified framework uh, um, from the associated lower prices. Um, and, uh, um, and so uh, um, we're uh, strongly encouraging um, uh, widespread adoption of the, of the framework. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, looking forward, uh, Joint Working Group 1 is uh, planning to revise uh, other documents in the 62257 series uh, in order to um, update them and make them um, more relevant for um, uh, energy access uh, activities. Um, priority areas include uh, solar home systems. Um, uh, and so the Joint Working Group 1 has identified uh, the document 6257-9-6, which includes uh, coverage of solar home systems as a, as a priority document for, for revision. Um, microgrid for rural electrification are another document that has been identified as a, as a priority document. Um, and so that is 6257-9-2. And a third area that's been identified as a priority area is um, solar street lighting systems. And that will require the development of a uh, of an entirely new document, um, and that is something that uh, the working, Joint Working Group 1 is um, uh, interested to pursue uh, in the near term. And um, uh, um, uh, given these, uh, the, these priorities, um, uh, we are, of course, interested to have um, uh, stakeholder input into this process. and. Um, if that's something you're interested to do, I would encourage you to contact um, either uh, Francois or Howard uh, Barikmo, um, and um, uh, we can find ways of integrating uh, uh, you into that uh, into that stakeholder process. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I will um, close and thank um, uh, thank the organizers and thank all of you for. Uh, for, for joining the webinar, and um, I'll now pass things over to, uh, to Guilain Fournay, who will discuss um, um, uh, a discounting program that IEC is uh, prepared to offer for the 6257 series. So uh, thank you very much, and um, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Guilain. Thank you, Arnie. Um, well, Depending where you are, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, now that you know more about the IC, about uh, TC82, and about IC62257, you may now be wondering how to get uh, those publications or this publication in particular. Well, the IC is glad to be able to offer reduced price 
not only on these uh, specific publications, but specific uh, publication, but also other parts of the 62257 series. Um, as you've seen, the IC standards uh, facilitate access to sustainable energy. They also help developing countries to comply with the WTO TBT agreement. So now let's have a look at the uh, technical specification uh, IEC 62257 part 9 section 5. Um, edition 2.0 has been uh, published um, earlier last month, uh, the 3rd of uh, April to be precise. And if you are already uh, an expert in IEC Standards. You may have noticed that the title uh, compared to the previous edition has changed. Now it's Recommendations for Small Renewable Energy and Hybrid Systems for Rural Electrification, Part 9-5, um, Integrated System Selection of Standalone Lightning Kits for Rural Electrification. As, um, Quite often, all titles are very long, as you may notice. Um, so let's have a look at the different options. So let's uh, have the next slide, please. Depending on your needs, uh, you may want just the 62257-9-5. Uh, and um, in that case, um, it's just one publication, either it's up to you uh, in paper or PDF electronic format. You have the choice. Um, each publication has a list of uh, normative references. Uh, next bullet, please. So for this uh, publication, we have 12 other publications that are referenced in uh, 62257 part 9, uh, section 5. They are almost appearing. Um, so that gives us a total of 13 uh, publications. Either for the publication on its own or for the publication with the normative references, we are very happy, uh, next bullet please, we are very happy to be able to offer a 58 percent discount, uh, which uh, translates, talking about uh, Swiss francs, because being based in uh, Switzerland, all prices are in Swiss francs, so I will uh, let you convert in your local uh, currency. Um, so instead of 340 Swiss francs, the publication on its own would be 143 Swiss francs. If you choose to have the publication and the normative references, so I repeat, 13 publications, in that case it would be 1,078 Swiss francs instead of 2,567. So that's what we offer as a, an option one, with a 1A and 1B as you notice. Know. For option two, here it's a huge, huge package. Why is it huge? Well, because you would get the full series of a 62257, not only all the different parts, 17, but also all the normative references, which equals a total of 136 publications. Next bullet, please. So for this um, huge package where you get everything and even more, uh, again, we would be very happy to offer you a 58% discount. And in Swiss francs, I know it's a lot of money, but I repeat, 136 publications. So the price would be 9,982 Swiss francs instead of 23,766. So that's for option two, the, the full package, as we may call it. But we also have a third option. Um, it's what we call pick and choose. So basically, any publication in the series 
uh, next bullet, please. Of course, um, if you want the uh, part 9, section 5, I recommend that you refer to option 1. But any other uh, publication in the series with or without the normative references, again, it's up to you, depending on your needs. In that case, next bullet, please. We have a suspense here. Apologies, yes, it's um, no, it's, okay. up on it's, it's a dramatic again. effect. Yes. Um, yes, there you go. There it's there. Thank you. <laughs> so for the total flexibility, pick and choose in that case because it's a customized offer that we, we would uh, uh, process the order according to do to your needs. In that case, the discount would be fifty percent. So that's what um we can offer, and you may uh, wonder if um, there are any conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, uh, the only conditions, it's very simple. We ask you to be from one of the uh, SE for all country and belong to the IC family. Um, so I'll let you refer to uh, my colleague's presentation to, to see if um, you, you fit uh, the criteria. So uh, thank you, and uh, now uh, back over to you, Vicky. Great. Thank you, everyone, for uh, these great, great presentations. And uh, just to remind the audience, uh, this is now our time for questions and answers, um, and our panelists are very happy to address any questions that you have on the materials that they presented. Um, I do have one that came in specifically for you, Arnie, and um, this question came in, and basically he's, he's asking, um, he would like to know if there is any timeline for the publication of the documents that you mentioned that needed um, a bit of updating regarding the solar home systems, microgrids, and the solar street lighting. Um, yes, uh, so first, uh, thanks for the question and uh, the interest in those documents. The um, uh, timeline for those um, is uh, probably varies a, a little bit. Um, I would say for the solar home system and microgrid documents, um, the group is uh, likely to be looking to have an initial draft uh, that could be um, shared for stakeholder uh, comment uh, probably in the next six months, um, um, but we need to, um, uh, it, it could be that that will come sooner, but we need to uh, um, uh, uh, um, talk with a few of the, uh, of the key uh, members who are working on this uh, to get an exact timeline before, before specifying that uh, a bit more carefully. On the um, street lighting document, um, because it's a, a new publication, um, the process could take a, a little bit longer for uh, for drafting. Um, it's possible that that also could be available in the next six months, but uh, it could take a, a little bit longer than that. Okay, but definitely coming in the near, you know, next six months or so. So um, that's very good to know. Thank you for that. Um, another question has come in from one of our attendees in Mexico, um, asking, uh, basically stating they're not sure if they're an affiliate country. Um, as they didn't see a country, you know, listed in the IEC. Um, and in case um, they're interested to participate, uh, she would like to know how they can start the communication to discuss this option. Um, Princess speaking here. So Mexico is a member, a full member of the IEC. So there should be no problem to uh, benefit from our commercial offer. Now we just have to put it into place <laughs> with the uh, sustainable energy for all uh, list of countries. I guess Mexico is might be in this uh, list of countries that I don't know. But as from the point of view of the IC, there's no problem. Great. Thank you so much, Francois, for that. And. Um, uh, I'll, I'll share some email information with you, so you know, uh, to make contacts and such as that, to perhaps start the discussion. 
Um, next question, and this may be again for um, you, Arnie, and, but it could be to the entire panel. Um, regarding the microgrid standard, how is this process envisioned to occur? Um, so the, the, um, the microgrid document is, of course, one that is, uh, ha has already been published uh, in, an uh, in an initial um, edition. Um, and so what I would first uh, do is encourage um, people who are interested to, to um, uh, review the, the, um, the current version of the document, which is 62257-9-2. Um, and uh, the joint working group has um, identified a set of um, uh, countries uh, or, or um, representatives from countries within the working group to uh, form a subcommittee to um, uh, um, uh, review a set of, uh, of possible revisions and to discuss that within the group. If there are people who are interested to provide comment um, or suggestions for um, uh, possible revisions of that document, um, I would encourage them to um, contact Howard Barikmo, um, uh, and he can pass that information on to um, one of the co-organizers of the, uh, or co-conveners of the working group, um, Siva and uh, Leon Drotsky. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, I think having the contact information for the people who are interested to play a role would would help us to incorporate them into the process most effectively. Okay, great. Thank you um, for that great answer. Um, let's see. Next question is regarding uh, lighting global standards. Um, and the question is, what might be the fundamental differences between the lighting global standards and standard CB certification and or CE certification for lighting projects? And uh, this question was posed by Joseph of Trade Without Borders. So uh, I, I can um, address that as well. The um, Lighting Global uh, Quality Assurance Framework, of course, um, focuses on um, uh, minimum quality and durability uh, for products. And it uses the IEC 6257-9-5 uh, test methods to uh, make that evaluation. Um, uh, programs like CE, uh, I think, focus primarily on um, safety questions rather than on uh, um, this, the types of quality assurance metrics that uh, are the focus of, of something like uh, the, the Lightning Global Quality Assurance Framework and the IEC 6257-9-5 document. Okay, great. Thanks, Arnie. Um, next question that has come in. Um, is, uh, is there a list of 54 products meeting the minimum criteria available? Um, is this a question that translates over to you? Yes. I mean, okay, great. Uh, th th there is a list. Um, the Lighting Africa website, uh, um, which is www.lightingafrica.org, uh, includes a section on it that um, lists all of the um, the uh, products that have met the minimum quality standards, uh, and it also indicates products that have, in addition to meeting the minimum quality standards, have, have also met some program-specific performance targets. Uh, and that web page uh, can be accessed from the main Lighting Africa web page, or uh, if you go directly to www.lightingafrica.org slash specs, uh, as in S-P-E-C-S, uh, that will take you to that page. Um, I think currently there are 49 uh, products listed there. Um, there are a few that uh, passed very recently that will take another uh, week or two to, to, uh, to be posted. Um, but um, um, uh, in general, all of the products that have uh, uh, met the minimum quality standards and uh, have currently active um, um, uh, uh, test results um, uh, are, are listed there. Uh, 
according to the program, the test results are valid for a period of two years. And so uh, there um, will, of course, be some products that uh, are discontinued by the manufacturer for, or for whatever other reason uh, will be, uh, um, uh, eventually those test results will, will expire and, uh, and that product will no longer be listed. And so um, uh, that, that also can occur. But um, in, um, in general, all of the products that, uh, that have currently active test results and have met those, those requirements are listed on that site. Great, thank you so much. Um, let's see, next question. Can you comment on any in-country standards that compete with the IEC standards? Do you know of any such situation? Uh, there certainly are countries that have um, their own set of um, uh, quality requirements for um, things like solar lanterns or other similar products. Um, they, uh, uh, I, I don't have a, a um, comprehensive knowledge of all of the, the um, countries that, uh, that have those, but it, I think it's only just a, a handful of countries um, uh, currently. And so that actually provides us with, a, with an excellent opportunity to achieve harmonization because uh, there isn't already a patchwork of um, competing uh, quality frameworks uh, in this space. Um, uh, the um, uh, IEC document um, and the Lighting Global Framework um, are uh, very early in terms of, of um, uh, setting up uh, quality standards for for uh, and a quality assurance framework for this uh, for this space. So unlike a number of other products historically, this this is a great opportunity to achieve broad harmonization if we can um, get governments and uh, other uh, uh, programs to uh, to adopt this uh, this single framework. Okay. And and on that note, um, a follow up question came in uh, asking um, not only in the in the framework of competing. But are there um, those that would be complementary to IEC standards? Um, well, cer certainly within the um, IEC framework, there are um, uh, there are uh, certain other certifications or or tests that uh, mm -hmm. that can complement or that are um, uh, potential inputs for. Um, for, uh, for that process. So there are a few things like, for, for example, if, if a product is able to um, uh, achieve uh, um, uh, CE certification or some of the other similar certifications, those are things that um, can be listed on, um, on uh, the specification sheets that are developed uh, through the Lighting Global Program when a product uh, meets the, the minimum quality standards and is eligible to receive the, that that kind of uh, a, of a spec sheet, um, and so the the, uh, the those are complementary in a in a certain way, uh, and also indicate uh, something something about those those products. Um, but I wouldn't say that there um, uh, are. Uh, other frameworks that would act as a substitute uh, in the eyes of, of the Lighting Global Program. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, Arnie, and this question is for you. <laughs> um, can you elaborate on IFC's involvement in further discounts in addition to the IEC's offer and how practitioners might be eligible for or um, able to access those? Um, th there has been some discussion within the World Bank group um, to um, uh, offer additional discounts. That that framework is not yet final, and so I don't want to um, uh, provide comment or um, or confirm that that's definitely going to happen. But there are uh, definitely has been some discussion about that, and I think there's a decent chance that that uh, that will happen in the coming months. Okay, great. Um, Another question, actually a country-specific question, uh, and the question that came in uh, is, can someone from Belgium benefit from the discount? 
Um, I, I, I think um, my understanding of the, the discounts as they're set up, and, and Ghislaine can comment on this as well, my understanding is that uh, um, as long as the country is uh, affiliated with SE for All and, um, and is an IEC, is part of the IEC family, then, then it's eligible to receive the, the, that discount. Yes, Arnie, uh, thank you, and I confirm that it is correct that the both condition is and, not or. So uh, Belgium is indeed in the IEC family, but um, as you can imagine, is not in the SE for all uh, list. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, uh, this next question is uh, for Francois and also for Gilan. Um, uh, they would like to ask you if you could elaborate on what the process would be for interested practitioners to access the discounts going forward. So, um, ideally, we, we would like uh, to know as soon as possible if there will be an additional discount that uh, we could uh, beneficiate to, to the people interested in this uh, publication, uh, series of publications. Um, so if um, we move forward uh, without any additional discount from the World Bank or any other organization to benefit for the, the, the offer that has just been presented, um, in that case, um, the order would be a process uh, if you want manually by my team and uh, the um, uh, the person interested uh, would simply have to, to contact by us by email and uh, that, like this we, we can double check if the, the, the two conditions are, are met and uh, move forward. And of course the SE for all we, would be copied to 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 stay in the loop. Mm -hmm. Uh, Francois speaking, I, I just wanted to, to add in that what we really need is to have an updated uh, list of the countries that are involved in the Sustainable uh, Energy for All project. And as soon as we have that at the IEC, then it will be quite easy for my colleagues to check if the person is on time to receive the discount. Okay, great. Um, thank you both very much. Um, I just want to let you know we've had several other questions come in, but looking at the clock, I see our time is, um, you know, nearing the end of the scheduled time for the webinar. So I think I have time for one more question. But uh, I'd like to let everyone know who uh, did ask questions that we did not have enough time to answer. I will forward your questions to our panelists. Um, so that they can respond to you directly. Um, and, um, you know, again, apologies that we don't have enough time on the webinar to answer everyone's questions, but we will see that they are answered subsequent to, you know, the end of the webinar. So thank you all who have submitted these questions, and again, um, we'll be responding to those um, subsequent to the webinar. Um, so with that I do. I, I did promise one more question out of this. So, um, and the last and final question is: Can all of the discussed IEC standards be tested and certified by standard labs all over the globe, such as uh, ITS and TUV um, and others? The um, uh, sorry, I guess it. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe that question is directed to me. This is Howard. Uh, I can't guarantee that every test lab throughout the world will do that, but uh, TUB will. They have done it for all the other IEC documents that we have written, and there are a number of other laboratories throughout the world that will do it. But uh, So there are, there are plenty that, that are capable of doing it. I suspect that there will be others, too, that will be doing it just so that they can also get in this, uh, this game of uh, of providing lighting devices for uh, developing countries. Arne, over to you. Yeah, I, I, I would support that. The, the, um, 
none of those labs that uh, currently are um, accredited to test to this specific method, but that's just because it was um, uh, only um, uh, published uh, just a month ago. And so, uh, um, uh, but uh, but um, all, all of those commercial testing labs have the capability of, of doing that, and um, uh, I'm sure that a number of them will, will do that. There are test labs that have been uh, doing that kind of testing uh, within the Lighting Global Framework, and those, those labs are already set up to do that testing. Um, but I would expect uh, additional commercial labs to, uh, to um, uh, uh, move towards uh, being accredited to do that kind of testing going forward uh, in the very near future. Great. Thank you again, everyone, for um, uh, your very uh, thoughtful and thorough responses. Um, and, and to the audience for your great questions, uh, we really appreciate um, not only your attendance, but your interest in this uh, really great topic. And so with that, I think we'll turn it over now um, to do our little quick survey. So Heather, if you could put up the survey question for the audience. And we'll give you all a few seconds to answer this, and um, then I'll close it out and go to the next question. They're very short, very only three questions to answer. So uh, we'll start with number one, which the question is, um, did the webinar content provide you with useful information and insight? So go ahead and click the radio button. That um, most compliments uh, your thoughts, and we'll give you a few seconds to do that. Function working, Heather? I can't see on my end. Yes, it is. Yes, okay, it is. So we'll close that and move to the next. Okay, thank you. Um, second question for our uh, participants. Uh, the webinar presenters were effective. And again, you have the uh, five multiple choice um, options to answer. And with that, I think we can move to question number three, which is, overall, the webinar met my expectations. And again, we'll give you a few moments to answer. Great. Thank you, everyone. We, we really do appreciate your feedback. It's very important to us. It helps us know what we're doing right and areas where we can improve. Um, so we thank you for your responses. And with that, um, I'd like to turn um, the webinar back over to Yasmin Erboy from the UN Foundation um, to offer a few closing remarks on Rashinda's uh, behalf. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. Uh, hi, this is Yasemin Arboy with the UN Foundation. On behalf of Richenda, I just wanted to thank all of you for joining us for this webinar and also thank our presenters for sharing the details of IEC's current work, their new standards pertaining to solar PV systems, and the steps that are being taken uh, to reduce the barriers to access their costs. Um, can represent for some practitioners. We just wanted to let you know that this webinar is just the first step to providing information on this exciting opportunity to our practitioners. Uh, through the Energy Access Practitioner Network, we will be in touch with further developments and also materials pertaining to the process that will be put in place um, to take advantage of these discounts in the coming days. If you have any questions or concerns in the meantime, please feel free to contact me. Most of you should have my email information already, and we will circulate everybody's emails um, at the end of this webinar, as Vicky mentioned. So thank you very much. And Yasmin, thank you very much for those nice closing remarks. So with that, I'd just like to 
um, state that on behalf of Clean Energy Solutions Center, um, I'd really like to extend a very hearty thank you to all of our expert and distinguished panelists we had today. You did a, a terrific job of informing the audience on, on these standards and um, opportunities. Um, and I also want to extend a thank you to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. You've been a great audience. You've submitted terrific questions. And we know you all are busy, so we appreciate your time um, and effort to be here. Um, I also invite our attendees to check the Solutions Center website you know, over the next few weeks if you would like to, again, view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentation. Again, I have the URL link up on this slide um, uh, for you to um, access these presentations. Um, and also, you can go to our uh, main training page and, and view previously held webinars. You'll find many topics of interest, I'm sure, that um, you might like to uh, take a little time to look at. Um, let's see. We Additionally, we have information on upcoming webinars and other training events. And uh, we really also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solutions Center resources and services, and including the no-cost policy, the no cost policy support that we provide um, to policymakers around the world. So with that, I wish um, you all a great rest of your day. And we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. And with that, uh, this concludes our webinar. Thank you.